Good afternoon and welcome to the weekly Learning Connects of the European uh, Training Foundation, which uh, this week is on a special edition on the last day of this April, which is a month we have devoted to a campaign uh, focusing on green skills. Uh, this uh, live is co-hosted by the ILO uh, Employment and we are very pleased uh, to, to share this conversation uh, with them and with you all who are following us live on YouTube, on Facebook and on LinkedIn. So today we are talking about an exciting topic, green jobs, what's next and i'd like to uh, welcome my distinguished guests olga stieska ilina senior skills and employability specialist and work area leader skills strategies for future labor markets at the international labor organization welcome olga hello everyone thank, thank you, you for being with us and Roman Bortard, human capital development expert at the european training foundation welcome Roman. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. So uh, we know that uh, transforming jobs into uh, green ones is a priority for our future. I think we all want to know, would love to know in these times of uncertainties to know how our future will look like and what green jobs will arise in the coming years and how we will be ready, if we will be ready to take upcoming opportunities. So, uh, Olga, let's uh, begin, ladies first, uh, by putting the spotlight on green jobs indeed, but what do we mean by green jobs? We know you're a great expert, so over to you. Thank you for being with us, Olga. Thank you so much. Yes, indeed, uh, green jobs, we, we have a definition in that of what green jobs are. Uh, these are for us in, for the first uh, in the first uh, instance. These are decent jobs. Decent jobs that means that these are productive employment jobs with fair income, with good job security at the workplace, with social protection, with rights at work, with right to collective bargaining, social dialogue. Um, and these are also jobs that contribute to either preserving or restoring the environment. Uh, and this can be done in traditional sectors such as um, manufacturing, agriculture, construction, or in uh, the so-called green sectors such as renewable energy or energy efficiency. The whole idea is that green jobs improve, improve the efficiency in the use of energy and resources, uh, in the use of materials as well, uh, that they um, limit the, green the greenhouse gas emissions, minimize, minimize waste and pollution, and protect and restore ecosystems. They also support adaptation to climate change. So it's not only mitigation measures, but also adaptation to climate change, which is very efficient, which is very important, sorry, especially in some sectors such as agriculture. Of course, there are shades of green. Not all green jobs are already completely green. There are shades of green. And the whole idea, the policy idea behind the concept of green jobs in DILO is that basically any, any job can become greener. Even uh, in brown sectors, jobs can be greener than they are. And this is uh, the whole you know, the area of potential of improving the, the sustainability concept uh, within the, the work area. We also have in DILO statistical definition of green jobs uh, approved by the International Conference of Labor Statisticians in 2013, which basically provides the granularity of measurement of what I've been speaking about, how to identify the, the green jobs in, in specific sectors. Thank you very much, um, Olga. We'll go more into the, the detail of, uh, of, the, of the green jobs, the types of green jobs, examples. Uh, very interested by your uh, definition of the, the shades uh, which we have. Uh, so there is not necessarily green or, or gray, but there are shades indeed. Uh, and uh, this, I'm sure, is of interest for uh, our participants. Before giving the floor to Romain, I'd like to uh, say hi to all those who are uh, getting engaged in the conversation. Uh, hello, wherever you are. Do let us know. I see that we have uh, many participants um, following from Algeria, India, Morocco, um, uh, Tunisia, Egypt, Algeria again, Izmir, Gaza, uh, 
Tunisia, Cairo. Uh, so um, there are already some questions which are popping up. Uh, don't uh, uh, don't be impatient. They will take them on board just a, a few minutes later. So keep on sharing your questions, and we'll include th them in the conversation. Romain, uh, from a uh, European Union perspective, the, the EU has uh, recently launched uh, the EU Green Deal, which says that uh, we should not uh, be leaving, we should be leaving no one behind. Uh, what does it mean concretely and why is it relevant to talk about these aspects when we are focusing on green jobs and the future of green jobs? Romain. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, so, you know, if, if, if we look at the theory, um, the, the the past models, the economic models uh, in the past have created, uh, have brought many, many, much progress uh, throughout the world, but they've also brought um, negative externalities. One of them has been the income inequality. Um, <clears throat> and so um, the green, the green economy, the future green economy must be an opportunity for social progress. Um, the green transition, in a, in a sense, will, will not be successful if not everyone benefits from it. Um, so uh, the transition must be, of course, clean, it must be carbon neutral, but, in, um, but the, 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 the move towards a sustainable development model must also be socially just and fair. And, uh, uh, and, and, and theoretically, the, the idea is that you have uh, the sustainable sustainable development can be can be achieved through three goals and they're called the three e's often um, so you have environmental protection you have economic development and you have social equity each of these goals will contribute to sustainable development and sustainable development will not happen if one of these is missing and this is why um, social equity social progress making sure that all workers and students in the future when they start working, that everybody uh, benefits from the transition. And that includes um, uh, people who may be currently working in industries that are um, considered uh, dirty. Um, they, 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 they need to benefit from the transition too. So that's the idea. Leaving no one behind means that um, everybody is involved um, in, in, the, in the transition. And to give an example concretely, um, if we look at the situation in, inside the EU, but um, in the neighboring um, region, uh, which is the region for which ETF uh, has, uh, has the mandate, um, we, we see uh, different stages of development, uh, different levels of exposure to climate-related risks, um, different features of the national economies, um, and of course, different skill systems. Um, so in, in some of these regions, um, the employment is mainly dependent on a single heavily polluting industry and others not. Um, this means that the transition will be um, very different. Um, what needs to be done will, will differ widely across regions and, and countries. And this is why um, all the measures that will be, uh, that are already being implemented, but the future ones also, must pay particular attention to the most marginalized groups uh, because they will be most vulnerable to the fast-changing labor market. Um, and there's no reason why they should bear the cost of this transition. So all the strategies for a just transition must be context-sensitive. They must look at what, is the, what are the needs in that region, in that country, in that sector, so that um, um, all people involved can benefit from, from the change. This is, uh, this is, in a nutshell, uh, the, the answer. Um, but of course, um, human beings are not commodities. Huh? We, we all agree with that, of course. Um, and so you cannot direct people to different jobs, um, even if it's more sustainable job opportunities. So what's important is that we safeguard employment, for safeguarding employment in the long term, it requires that we put a focus on the individuals and not on the jobs themselves. So the skilling process is at the heart of, of the advancement of practices and culture that will allow the businesses to transform and recruit more. Thank you very much, uh, Roma. Actually, uh, I think that the fact that we uh, we have 
touched upon uh, the, the EU Green Deal um, is leading me to a question which uh, I had foreseen to introduce in the conversation a bit uh, later for uh, for Olga, um, because uh, also the, the, the ILO is um, has at its heart the, uh, the principle that the green transition should mean having decent work for, for everyone. Um, could you please elaborate uh, on these aspects, uh, keeping into account that uh, our audience on all channels is of course made of, uh, of, uh, of professionals from the learning sector, but is also made of, uh, uh, of um, followers who are simply just curious but by what we do. Um, so is the screen transition an opportunity or a, ch or a challenge for decent works? Thank you very much for the question. Um, from the ILO point of view, of course, this basically derives from our definition. It is certainly an opportunity. Uh, but it doesn't mean that any uh, green or greener job is, uh, is uh, decent um, automatically. It doesn't happen automatically. Mm -hmm. uh, in, imagine, for example, waste pickers. Waste pickers is one of... Uh, jobs uh, traditionally uh, in informal sector in developing countries and it's really the poorest people, mostly women actually, uh, who get engaged in this kind of activities. Of course, it takes um, some investment in turning uh, waste picking into recycling and waste management. And in fact, it has something to do also with uh, going um, more thoroughly and in depth and sophistication of those activities. Uh, and also moving up in the value chain uh, that may potentially, uh, of course, also move the agenda of structural transformation for developing countries um, and contribute to development itself, to the development process. But this doesn't happen without um, reskilling and upskilling of people, without providing them opportunities with getting uh, more advanced qualifications, because, of course, uh, for instance, waste management is far more complex uh, activity and sector compared to simple waste picking. Um, decent work uh, with all this, uh, with all this, its pillars, uh, including creation of employment, decent employment, uh, uh, including um, working conditions and pay, uh, social dialogue, and the right to organize. All these pillars are included now into the. Sustainable Development Goals Agenda, Sustainable Development Agenda of 2030, uh, and the, particularly the uh, the yeah, Goal 8, uh, which has something to do with uh, economic uh, growth and uh, achieving full employment for all, but also the whole number of goals that uh, contribute to the uh, to tackling climate change agenda. And what Roman was speaking about, just transitions, actually one of the um, ILO concepts, which uh, we put uh, several years ago at uh, one of climate negotiations uh, meetings. Since then, it has become uh, very thoroughly included in the climate negotiations, the just, just transition agenda, including the capacity, institutional capacity development, which comes along with the just transition. Uh, also, you know, we have some more opportunities since uh, 2015 and uh, uh, the, the Paris Agreement, uh, which uh, basically made a commitment to uh, the decreasing the um, uh, raise of the temperature uh, by 2 degrees and uh, ideally by 1.5 degrees. Since then, uh, all countries also committed to uh, coming up with their nationally determined contributions. These are the country programs uh, that basically um, display their commitment to the implementation of that agenda and prioritize certain activities in certain sectors. Uh, so these are all activities towards sustainable development. And they, uh, of course, uh, sub support also decent, decent work creation. Um, now with the COVID-19 uh, and particularly with the consequences of the pandemic to the situation on the labor market, what we know that uh, by the ILO estimates, so we probably are facing the situation of um, risks of an unemployment, which is probably four times worse than the last uh, financial crisis um, and the consequences of the financial crisis on the labor market. 
so what the countries do, however, this time, we see uh, unprecedented recovery packages that, that are put together by governments that target job creation. And big proportion of those um, uh, recovery packages actually are devoted to also creation of green jobs. So these are investments towards renewable energy, uh, towards energy efficiency, towards retrofitting on in infrastructure, um, including the American Jobs Plan, which is you know very ambitious uh, recovery package with a very large proportion which goes on into the creation of green jobs. So potentially this all may also increase the uh, segment of decent work and, and increase formality uh, because of course you know these packages and, and policy measures they are targeting uh, formalized sector and, and normally uh, conditions of work which are uh, quite decent. Uh, so we have to see how this will improve. But certainly also there is another aspect. Now, green jobs uh, is something what is quite um, attractive to, to young people. We have a huge problem with um, youth employment around the world. Um, and now, especially in the aftermath of the, of the crisis, so, uh, with the COVID-19, hopefully in the aftermath, we're still in the crisis. So we, probably it's, it's too early to, to speak about what happens after the crisis. We're still go through one, uh, but it has a very bad effect also on some groups of people, you know, as Roman said, it's not that everybody affected uh, the same way. Women are affected more than, than men and also young people are affected very badly, um, especially their, their transition to from school to, to work. And this is where you know, the creation of green jobs can potentially contribute uh, a, great, a great deal because of course, uh, you know, attracting young people to um, professions that are uh, traditionally prepared by vocational education training, such as you know, plumbers or electricians or laborers in, in manufacturing, for example, um, is actually not very easy. But if you say you're going to become a green plumber or a green electrician, this is a totally different story. Thank you very much, uh, Olga. Um, actually, for uh, for uh, for this uh, very um, comprehensive uh, overview on uh, on on what's happening around this planet, uh, one of the aspects which um, I particularly um, enjoy and I find very meaningful in these conversations, which we are having uh, on a weekly basis, basically since the the, the beginning of the pandemic in uh, in March last year is that um, they allow us to go beyond our national spheres and to have a look at what's happening beyond the conversations which very often even in the media um, we see and, and we, we keep the, our eyes only on what's happening in our mini world. This is obviously also because of the, the difficulties that which we are facing but when you say that uh, we are facing a risk of four times higher unemployment uh, than it happened in the in the previous uh, crisis, these data are absolutely um, striking. I hope I'm reporting correctly what you what you just said, um, and um, it's uh, it's indeed um, very uh, very relevant to be focusing on uh, the perspective. Um, mainly uh, and but not only but of course for 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 young people and for tackling uh, youth unemployment when talking about about green jobs uh, we will go back to this uh, i see that uh, your interventions are raising a lot of interest olga so if you don't mind i'd like to take a few questions from the audience um, there's a one question from majid abdo uh, how can economic growth uh, be uh, uh, no sorry uh, i think there's a bit of a misspelling but the principle i think it's how uh, can economic growth be a setback or uh, one of the difficulties for making our jobs greener um, I mean, I assume our our follower is asking you about the links and the interconnection between the growth of a country and uh, the fact that in these countries maybe jobs are more easily becoming greener than somewhere else. Yeah, look, uh, first of all, you know, the unemployment, of course, these are all estimates. We don't know precisely how the situation will unfold. Uh, because basically, you now these are estimates that derive from the loss of working hours. 
as you know, translated from uh, the uh, anti-pandemic or anti-crisis measures, um, some some jobs partially translate into loss of working hours, and some uh, simply lost jobs. So it still has has to be seen uh, whether these jobs will be really lost for good or not. It's the it's one thing, and another thing is also we have to see how quickly recovery will go because this is not a regular crisis. So this is just you know on on the margins of what we discuss. Now, how growth translates into green jobs? uh not automatically you know you can have growth without becoming sustainable but then uh what will be left to you know we're not even speaking about the future generations we even speak about about what will, will be left in in few years uh so potentially uh, it may be growth now but a huge loss in the future a huge loss of uh, gdp uh, because the climate change uh, will have and already has a very uh, negative impact on uh, the life of communities, on income generation opportunities. It causes uh, climate-related migration. Um, so it's not a sustainable way. In other words, uh, you know, there are countries, uh, developing countries and advanced countries included, that continue uh, investing in, for example, fossil fuel um, energy generation. Uh, but is it a sustainable model? So this is the question. Maybe it generates the immediate growth and it generates also the job creation immediately, but it's not sustainable in the longer run. So I think you also wanted to discuss something in relation to the future of work. Of course, climate change is one of the major disruptors along with other uh, drivers of change, such as uh, um, digitalization, technological change with the whole automation aspect, and then potentially also partial destruction of jobs, but also potential to create jobs, uh, demographic change and other changes. And then climate change comes right into the middle of all that spectrum. And now the difficulties of the transition are multiplied also by the COVID-19 situation and the crisis of jobs availability in the labor market. Um, and obviously, in order to ease that transition, we need very complex measures. We need uh, active labor market policies that would you know, target um, individual you know, disadvantaged groups, uh, such as you know, youth, women, migrant workers, uh, aging workers also that's relevant for Europe, um, but also to have massive reskilling and upskilling programs, attracting investment into reskilling and upskilling so that the jobs that have a potential to be generated, sustainable jobs, green jobs, can actually have relevant retraining, upskilling, reskilling programs so that people have an opportunity to get to those jobs. Because, you know, pretty much in the, in the green uh, structural change. This is how it goes. Those who get the tra training or retraining, they get the jobs. We had some calculations produced in 2019 in two scenarios, just two scenarios. There could be more scenarios, obviously. Renewable energy and um, the circular economy scenario. So it's just the transition from fossil fuel to renewable energy generation and transition to circular economy scenario. So it's uh, instead of producing and basically dismantling, it's uh, producing, refurbishing, reusing, repairing, and so on. So this is kind of a sustainable way in the economy. So that two scenarios alone may bring, by 2030, more than 100 million jobs. But they may be also quite a lot lost, cumulatively close to 80 million. But I always underline the same thing. We don't have to lose those 80 million jobs. We can actually generate 1 million job, 100 million jobs globally and reskill and upskill people, including now some in-depth reskilling, meaning changing occupation, and relocate people to the newly created jobs. There will be enough jobs for everybody, just in these two scenarios. And potentially, some of these jobs and job creation potential, which is positive in the net uh, destruction minus uh, creation, uh, creation minus destruction, um, they may compensate for some of the loss that comes as a result of automation. 
which is very important for the world. It's a ma one of the major concerns at the moment. So there is a huge potential there. Thank you very much, um, Olga. Um, uh, Romain, I hope you're, you're patient for a few more minutes because I see that uh, we are really being overwhelmed with um, questions from uh, for Olga. And uh, actually, there are um, two uh, questions which I wanted to bring in the conversation now because uh, they are uh, indeed putting the spotlight on, uh, on youngsters and on schools. Uh, one comes from Georgi Jacob, I hope I'm pronouncing it uh, correctly, from uh, LinkedIn, who would like to know if the ILO has got any program to promote uh, about uh, the, the topic we are discussing now, so green jobs for, uh, for students uh, in their school age. Uh, Olga, is there anything you'd like to flag? Yeah, look, we don't work with individual schools, of course. No, we work at the policy level. So we work with uh, governments, employers, and workers. A lot of what we do actually happens at the sectoral level. And what we do, we uh, help countries to um, update their competency standards and curricula. So uh, green the whole new TVET program, uh, to green uh, TVET uh, campuses, schools, whole provision. Um, now we are, uh, you know, we have uh, actually quite some guidance documents. Now we are trying to also develop on how to uh, guidance documents specifically on greening to that step-by-step -step approach. Uh, already implementing this in in, a, in several countries. So this year we, we uh, roll it out in uh, Cambodia, Ghana, and uh, El Salvador. Next year there will be more countries to come. Uh, but so far, also, we had a lot of uh, green jobs and skills uh, programs. In Zambia, there was the construction sector with uh, training programs developed, uh, which targeted specifically young people. Uh, in Zimbabwe, there was a big program developed for renewable energy, which now continues and will cover the whole uh, region, the whole region in, um, uh, in South Africa. Um, and then um, uh, the um, um, and then we also had uh, some programs which were basically integrated in the uh, green jobs um, assessment and also the just transition uh, package, let's say, of programs. For example, in in the Philippines, in the Philippines, they uh, developed the Green Jobs Act by government, and of course, it was. Uh, um, a collective exercise involving uh, some stakeholders, um, particularly also on the, on the private on the side of the private sector, and involved a lot of coordination between ministries. So this Green Jobs Act uh, is being implemented, um, and this was done also with the support of the you know, just transition interventions from the ILO. Uh, and they also targeted a uh, human resource development plan, which is linked to the Green Jobs Act. Um, and this implementation is supported by their um, TESDA. TESDA is a, is a tripartite uh, technical vocation education and training authority that actually looks at the uh, upgrading or greening the qualifications they have in the whole packages that, that go together. So what we, when we work with countries, we try to work at the system level so that the impact is larger. Of course, the schools are involved, individuals, training providers, they're involved in that process and they all benefit from that process, but it's not like one-to-one -one work with the school. Also, you know, just to add, we have a, actually quite big uh, capacity development program in the ILO, uh, which we deliver together with the International Training Center in Turin, where you are based, uh, Daria. Um, and that uh, they often would deliver also at country level or regional level. So they will also have um, a training on, on uh, green jobs. We have a training on skills for green jobs, skills for a green future. Uh, and some specific modules for sectors like waste sector or energy um, and what it actually involves in terms of um, greening the sector, including skilling, the skilling component. Thank you very much. We'll go back to the to the skilling elements super soon uh, with Romain. Just one second question uh, from, uh, from uh, another follower, um, Esteban Chavez. 
uh, now it, let's say going from the from the big picture to uh, uh, an advice, uh, Olga. What field would you recommend to junior graduates um, junior graduates to look for a job within the energy and green future field? This is a question from Mr. Ban. Not sure if you have the answer, but uh, someone really skilled and an expert like you might give a very good advice. What field do you recommend junior graduates to look for a job within energy and green future field? Um, well, I think much depends on where you are. <laughs> so it's not like universal answer, unfortunately, because in you know, some countries we don't invest in this kind of activities. Uh, but you know, if you are if you are lucky enough to be in uh, one of those countries that prioritize uh, green transition, uh, so that would be certainly one of um, European countries uh, because we have now the, the green uh, deal program. Um, I, I think it will also affect the countries uh, that uh, that also benefit from the EU support. Uh, so in the European um, neighborhood. Um, Many other countries uh, that also prioritize greening, like now, now the U.S. is uh, also looking quite, um, quite rosy on that on the pink agenda. <laughs> um, there are many other countries, including in you know, developing countries. I just mentioned uh, a few that also prioritize the green agenda. So if you are, if you happen to be in one of those countries, of course, you you can go to you know, any occupation. Um, uh, that will be demanded in uh, in renewable energy, energy efficiency, uh, more broadly, green building or you know, greening manufacturing, manufacturing the parts which are used in renewable energies, for example. Depending on on your interest, you know, the, when we speak about the green transition, it's not only uh, environmental specialists that who will be required. No, actually, we speak about plumbers, electricians, construction workers, manufacturing workers engineers, associate engineers, uh, plant operators, sales workers. You, you know, it, it, such as the few I mentioned. Um, so much depends also on your interest because this you, you have to go with your call, your vocation. I still believe it's very important for, for young people. But definitely, uh, you know, if countries invest into some green extension of the of a training program, for example, to train green plumbers. That's something to engage because that will be very much at the demand. Thank you very much, Olga, and I hope that uh, there, this advice uh, will be uh, useful to the, the, the kind participant to, to our conversation. There is another follower who is asking whether this conversation will remain uh, online. Answer is yes, it will remain uploaded on uh, both our YouTube, LinkedIn, and Facebook channel, so you will have uh, plenty of time to watch it again and to share it uh, around. Uh, Roman, apologies uh, for for having uh, postponed for for some minutes your your intervention, but we felt it was uh, interesting to introduce some questions uh, from the audience uh, right now. But Olga, uh, right a few minutes ago, mentioned the word skills, and uh, this is very much uh, at the at the core of the ETFs work and the ETF has very recently announced the finalists of uh, its first uh, Green Skills Award uh, call. So what, what are the stories behind uh, this, uh, this award and, and, and why are they relevant and even more so for this conversation? Romain. Right, thank you. So yes, as, as you said, we, we've launched, uh, we, one of the things that ETF has been trying to do is to collect good practice across uh, across the regions of our interest, uh, which are a little bit narrower than, than ILO, but uh, uh, but but there's still many, many countries. So we've launched a, a call for good practice where um, anyone was uh, free to to send uh, whatever they're doing um, in order to 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 move forward on on green skills and and the green transition, we've received over a hundred um, excellent um, uh, project ideas, um, including not only ideas but projects that were already being implemented. Um, it was really hard to um, to to select the the finalists, but uh, in the end uh, we, we made it and and we picked what what we thought were the most uh, um, compelling, um, relevant, um, uh, illustrative um, ones um, of, of the lot. And, and just to give you a, a few examples, 
um, the, for example, in Azerbaijan, just to pick that country, we, we found about we found out about this uh, public-private partnership where a private firm is training youth on green skills in the energy sector. Um, we thought that was uh, really interesting. We selected that one in Belarus. Um, we uh, we uh, we were, were in contact with a vet provider that is that has dedicated its training to students and teachers on the on the new green uh, technologies. A, um, a really really great example. We also have some examples from from uh, inside the EU. For example, there's one in in Belgium. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a European network, but, uh, but the, the, the head office is in Belgium, um, where they provide training to vulnerable groups to, um, so that they're, um, they're, they're better prepared to work in the um, uh, social e-commerce. So um, that's not, uh, that may not seem as a, as, a, as a green skill at first, but it is totally part of what the green transition uh, requires, that uh, e-commerce is more sustainable, and, and people need to operate that, and so they look at um, they look they, they they train the vulnerable groups. So this goes back to the first points that I was talking about about the, the inclusive um, uh, aspect, so that everybody uh, benefits. And these were mostly unemployed uh, people who will now be able to to work again um, in in the field of sustainable e-commerce. Um, we also had a, a fascinating example from from India where. Um, um, the, the, a, a number of, of secondary schools. So, of course, the numbers in India are, are very. Um, the magnitude is larger. It, it's uh, it's over ten thousand schools that have updated their their curricula to make sure that right from secondary school, the concept of employment um, is 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 taught to to students, understanding that green skills will be part of it. Um, so, we thought that was very progressive, and we selected that one too. Um, in Turkey, uh, we had an example um, about a, a, a school that has um, uh, taught students to code software um, to um, be able to measure their own carbon print. So we, of course, love that one because it's both um, a, a green scale or a, a, a improving people's understanding of their carbon print and, and their responsibility towards the climate, but it's also um, digital skills. And of course, these two things um, um, are, are very important. So we, we really um, enjoyed that and, uh, uh, and, and, we, and we selected it. Um, in Ukraine, um, we, uh, we, we read about this, um, this um, energy innova innovation hubs. Um, uh, basically, these are like um, uh, training centers um, uh, embedded inside universities where they teach um, how en energy efficiency can be improved. With uh, modern equipment, um, we thought that was very, very useful, and uh, we selected that one too. Um, in Albania, um, um, a with in the in the shipping industry, um, we found out about this very uh, interesting um, uh, project where um, they establish an innovative um, uh, ecosystem for the greening of existing professions within the maritime industry. Uh, we all know this is one of the most polluting industries. A lot needs to be done um, on that sector. Um, reading up about how uh, this the, the, this project is is is, is um, um, uh, networking the different stakeholders involved in, in in the sector to 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 figure out ways uh, innovative ways to reduce their environmental impact. Um, we thought that was a very compelling, and and we selected that one. Uh, we also had um, a. a, a, a an Italian case where um, there's a, a, a vet provider that is uh, teaching uh, green fashion courses where um, future fashion designers um, are being taught about um, uh, circular economy, uh, reducing waste, um, more efficiency in the use of resources. So we thought that was a very pertinent too. It was selected. Um, there's another one which is a pan European network based in the Netherlands, where um, they've established a training platform for urban greening. So um, they are teaching uh, different stakeholders, not only students, um, to address biodiversity, climate adaptation, and well-being in urban environments. This is something that's um, extremely important that we don't talk about enough, and, and we thought it was important that we select that one too. Um, and. Uh, Basically, that 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 that's it for for a quick uh, for a quick um, uh, review. What 
you were also asking me why are they relevant. Um, we, we found that uh, in most cases, the, the, what we thought were the best cases rely on, on, they have a number of common features and that's what we, we, we liked about it. So for example, they all rely on a functional network of diverse actors. Um, and, th and this is uh, basically our plea to uh, people interested, um, educators or education professionals to, uh, who are interested in this field to develop their network. This seems um, a, to be a, 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 a building block of, of first success. Um, also, in most cases, um, they grew following seed funding. And this is a pointer to governments and, uh, and donors that uh, we need to promote um, great ideas. There needs to be seed funding for these activities. Lots of people have many great ideas, but lack resources to implement. And this is where government, um, uh, regional, national, um, and, and donors come into play. Um, they also have uh, the, this other common feature, which is that they, they really think in terms of sustainability. So when they want to change something, uh, uh, clearly in all these cases, they're changing it uh, in a way that will last. Uh, so when, when we're talking about schools, uh, it's changing the curricula, which will be repeated every year. Um, when we talk about um, uh, centers uh, for, 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 for vets, they are embedded in existing educational um, centers. So really, the, 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 the concept of sustainability is at the heart of all these, uh, these, uh, these initiatives, and, and we really like that. Um, we also noticed that uh, most of them um, take the inclusion angle, um, so they do not only focus on, on high-level professionals or highly skilled professionals, but they uh, deal a lot with, um, um, well, the vulnerable groups, the, 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 the unemployed, um, the, the young people who may still not know what they want to do in the future, uh, people who need it most. And this goes back to the leaving no one behind, which we talked about at the beginning. Um, and finally, um, and, and this was uh, across the board, they all rely on a very advanced digital technology. So this goes hand in hand. The green um, uh, transition is going to be digital also. Uh, we clearly um, see that. Um, now, I hope I've, uh, I've whet your appetite I'm, and I'm, 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 I'm addressing the audience now because you can now vote. Uh, you can vote for your favorite. Uh, you can go to the ETF website. Uh, I'm sure somebody will link it, uh, it below. Um, and, uh, and, the, and the winners will be um, presented um, at our conference um, on the, at one of our uh, large conference, uh, which is scheduled for the 25th of June, uh, which is in partnership with UNESCO, EBRD, and ILO, um, and UNICEF. And, and the title is, is a bit of a mouthful. It's Building Lifelong Learning Systems, Skills for Green and Inclusive Societies in the Digital Era. Um, I think that says it all. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Romain. It says it all. The link has been uh, shared, I think, uh, in uh, the chats of all the platforms on which we are currently being streaming. So everyone is most invited to vote. Olga, you're also invited to go on our on our website and choose your preferred uh, stories. And given that we, um, we ju you just mentioned lifelong learning systems, uh, Romain, I'd like to um, uh, pop in with a with a question from uh, from one of the participants of our conversation who's actually put in the spotlight on something which was very well pointed out as super relevant by Olga. So Olga, what about skilling and reskilling for green jobs? What is happening in countries around the world? Is there anything which you could share more in detail on this specific aspect? Yes, thank you for that question. And yeah, lifelong learning is uh, you know, very high on the agenda, especially now when uh, with the results of the um, of, of work on, on the future of work in the ILO. The, you know, there was a high-level global commission with the report which came out in 2019 and then resulted in our centenary declaration on the future of work, which actually puts the human in very much at the center of that transition agenda. As I said, you know, we have multiple transitions, so we need to have a human-centered approach, uh, perhaps also revising the, the social contract and uh, one of the key areas of that human-centered approach is actually investing in people's capabilities. Um, that goes through you know, lifelong learning uh, in, the, in the sense of um, 
to, from the cradle to, to grave. Um, it's not only you know that we, we get the initial initial training and then we go to the labor market and we basically get the job for a lifetime. This pattern doesn't work anymore. We have to be ready that there will be many transitions, not only school to, to work, but also work to warm job to job transition throughout lifetime. And with this, you know, with this in mind, uh, uh, due to you know, many, many disrupting changes, including climate change, uh, of course, uh, the society and the economy has to build some, uh, some safety nets for people to be able to retrain throughout their lifetime. And perhaps even not even once, but many times uh, to, to learn uh, all that. And that's why also one of the core skills, which is uh, demanded uh, in the framework of uh, environmental changes, but also in the framework of any other change, is, um, is the capability of, to learn, the, the disposition to learn, the ability to learn. Um, so in, in, in terms of now li lifelong learning, uh, what is important is to, to have a system, an ecosystem, which would cater for interministerial coordination, um, policy coherence in a sense that it's, you know, it's, it's the education and training skilling policy that goes in line with, for example, environmental agenda, uh, as well as um, technical change, uh, digitalization agenda and any other um, trade or investment or, or industrial policy. Um, it has also to have an inbuilt platform for the, you know, for the dialogue with the, with the private sector so that we actually get the signals about which skills will be, will be needed. And that signals are, are sent back to the education and training system. And most of all, it has to have some kind of you know, um, efficient system of uh, financing, reskilling and up upskilling opportunities that will be uh, a shared responsibility of all parties. That means not only you know, government, not only private sector and not only individuals, but all in you know, all parties together through some innovative measures of financing, granting the access to that funding to all individuals, those ones who are also disadvantaged uh, included. Um, and also to be covered through the social protection measures so that you know, people go into training, retraining, um, and they have the comfort of, of keeping their um, their income for the time of retraining and they, then they can, can come back to the labor market perhaps in, in the new quality already. Uh, so in terms of what has been happening, you know, we, we did the review in 2011, uh, looking um, into the situation in 21 countries. And then we repeated this review in, in the same countries in 2018-19, uh, we added more. So now we have an idea of what is happening in 32, uh, an in-depth idea. Um, and, you know, there are some very good signs. So, for example, in uh, many low-income countries and some middle-income countries, the situation has really improved with, you know, investment into, into training, uh, and vocation education training and in uh, lifelong learning, other lifelong learning opportunities. Um, in, uh, also improvements in terms of the coherence between different sides of the policy. And, you know, we could see that there was more correlation uh, in the provisions of the environmental policy, which also has some clauses on education and training and vice versa. At the same time, we also saw that there was some regress especially in, in, uh, in a number of advanced countries where uh, public policy withdrew from some of the uh, pro-climate change measures and related social policy. And this we found as a, as a warning sign really. So it's not um, a straightforward picture. And I think that the world really needs to keep attention. There is a lot of discussion in the media and um, uh, and also in the, in the public in the public policy space on the effects of te technological change and digitalization, automation. Uh, it attracts a lot of attention. And I feel sometimes that the whole new climate change agenda, which affects all of us, all of us, is sometimes a little bit neglected. So I think we, we definitely need to mobilize that attention. That would be also the role for organizations such as ETF and ILO 
and I think it's a it's a it's a very good uh, opportunity also to address some of these discussions through the conference which was announced by Roman. Absolutely, thanks a million, Olga. When when you were when you were uh, going through uh, all the aspects which uh, which uh, are contributing to making a transition work or or not work in the way uh, we all would want it to happen. So with uh, uh, decent work for all and no one being left behind. I was thinking how. Uh, being myself a journalist and not an expert in the field, how complicated this uh, this all is. And uh, I was reading while we were talking a comment um, from one of our follower, Kazim of Ahad, who says, we need more awareness raising uh, projects about green skills and green jobs. And earlier on, there was another comment by um, a participant, I think from Poland, uh, who was raising uh, the, the concern of uh, the fact that uh, the, 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 this green conversation can create new jobs while a lot of people may lose um, their, their jobs and he's making the case of some Poland workers. So uh, this long thought to say, um, Olga, how, I mean, how can one uh, uh, start? Where, where should, uh, should one begin um, to make a positive engagement so that there is a vision which is inspiring towards this transition in which everyone can really have opportunities, uh, not only the ones who are maybe starting up uh, a new uh, enterprise, which has especially green features, but also the ones who have been employed for long, maybe in the gray um, industries. Um, how, how can this uh, awareness raising begin? And what also is the role of international organizations is all this? Yeah, I think the, the awareness raising is certainly a very, very important point. Um, and when it comes to climate change, of course, there are uh, annual COPs and there are also discussions about just transition. Uh, that's where international organizations engage uh, themselves as well, including the ILO, particularly on the, on the subject of just transition. Uh, but in addition, of course, you know, we, we have to develop capacities. That's what we're trying also to focus develop capacities, institutional capacities. This, I'm not speaking about individual capacities, institutional capacities in countries so that they um, realize uh, not only risks, but also huge uh, opportunities that can be brought by uh, the green transition. Of course, you know, in the short run, there may be uh, quite a painful transition, especially because we also have um, the situation of the COVID-19 and, and related jobs crisis. Uh, but in the medium to longer run, especially the the change, uh, the the employment creation potential is positive, and I think this has to be brought to the attention of um, governments and also private sector. Uh, a lot can be done at sectoral level because when you discuss actually with sector, uh, what can be you know done for the for the transition to the you know, greener production, greener products, greener services, greener processes which are can be employed and that what it, it means what kind of implications it has for uh, for skilling for skilling and upskilling um, that is actually quite uh, a clear way forward and, and at, at national level it's important to have a vision a vision uh, now the countries have their NDCs nationally determined contributions so that vision on the climate change, has to be also coupled with some um, social policy, including education and training, so that the transition is as smooth as possible. I know you know the concerns that come from Poland. So, for example, Poland uh, has been through a painful transition of you of losing um, mining jobs because mining sector has been um, shrinking uh, due you know to the sustainability reasons. And of course, one way is to provide some passive measures uh, uh, of uh, kind of the safety net that comes to, um, in, in terms of unemployment benefits. But a, a totally different approach would be to make sure that people who lose those jobs realize also what kind of opportunities they may 
get in growing sectors. And from our research, we know that if investment uh, is uh, taking place towards you know, renewable energy, towards circular economy, um, towards um, uh, you know, variety of, of uh, um, measures that uh, cater for resource efficiency, energy efficiency measures, uh, as well as adapt adaptability that creates jobs, which are actually quite interesting for people. They are interesting for um, young people. They are also potentially may be interesting for women. Uh, so, for instance, you know, we take a uh, tourism sector, which is now, of course, in a big crisis due to the COVID-19. But ecotourism is something quite interesting also for young people. And women are super, super interested to in engage themselves. Um, so this is just one example. There are many, many more, and this has to be um, a very you now uh, thorough work together with um, the pub, you know, uh, actors in the in the public sector, um, ministries, but also you now administration, uh, public employment services, career guidance, uh, education and training providers with the private sector to have a real vision how they can move forward and you know, constructing the vision of the future which would be positive for the country for the economy if we work in the sector for the concrete sector and then discussing together what it would take for all these sectors in order to meet that positive vision what kind of action will it take including those Activities and measures that are necessary to implement for education and training uh, to make sure that people can benefit from this newly created green jobs or greener jobs. Thank you very much, uh, Olga, for, for sharing your vision about having uh, a, a shared vision. Uh, Romain, these were, will be topics which we will keep on discussing also during our conference uh, in uh, next June, isn't it? Sorry, I just had to unmute myself. Yeah, absolutely. This is this is the core the core of the of the subjects that will be covered. I mean, it's a whole week. There will be a number number of, of um, issues and themes covered daily. Um, I, I would really encourage um, uh, viewers to to look up the the program on our website to see which one are they most interested in, so that they can follow closely. Absolutely, and uh, everything will be open to, to everyone uh, on a digital mode. So, as Romain just said, don't hesitate to go on uh, our uh, website and learn more about the program and how to follow the conversation. I think that this hour uh, went so quickly. Uh, I, I just find out now that it's, uh, it's already five, so we are at the end of this uh, thought-provoking and inspiring conversation on uh, Green Jobs, What's Next, which was uh, co-hosted by our friends at the uh, ILO. So I'd like to thank uh, my distinguished uh, guests for today, Olga strieska Ilina, Senior Skills and Employability Specialist and Work Area Leader, Skills Strategies for Future Labour Markets at the International Labour Organization. Thank you so much, Olga. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. And uh, thanks a lot to my colleague Romain Boitard, Human Capital Development Expert at the European Training Foundation. Thank you, Romain. You're welcome. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you. And thanks a million to all of you who have been following this conversation, engaging with uh, questions and comments. Uh, this interview will remain live, so you can watch it again. And with this interview, we conclude our campaign devoted to the topic of green skills. And as of tomorrow, we we'll start talking about the future of education for the whole month of May, which is indeed a super interesting and relevant topic also for a greener future. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a lovely evening and a lovely weekend. Bye. Bye-bye.